I'm George Siegel, and this is the Move the World podcast. If you have thoughts or ideas but are hesitant to put them into action, you've come to the right place because I'd like to introduce you to people with inspirational stories that motivate you to do something to make the world a better place. Thank you for joining me today. My first documentary film was called License to Parent. It was about how parenting is the most important job in the world, yet anybody can get that job. And as a result, there are a lot of problems that we see in the world on a daily basis as a result of this. Well, my guest today is a woman who went from not really thinking she wanted to be a parent to ending up uh, being the mother of four. Three of them came along as surprise triplets. That's quite a surprise. Sue Donlin, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me, George. Now, that is pretty uh, amazing. I, I want to touch on that first, but because when I was reading about you, you kind of seemed like a reluctant person for having children. I wouldn't have pegged you as somebody who, who really wanted that. And then you had triplets. Oh, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's comical. Um, anyone that knew me growing up is still laughing and chuckling over how I, of all people, would have ended up with natural triplets just trying to have my second baby. Uh, it was definitely a huge surprise. And yes, you're right. I wasn't the, the sort of person that, you know, wanted to grab somebody's baby and, and cuddle them or, you know, babysit for money. I was not interested in, in the, the life of, I didn't see myself as being a mom. I didn't see that in my future. It wasn't something I was actively pursuing until I met my husband and he wanted a family. And I thought, ah, you know, how hard could it be? <laughs> I, yeah, I guess you, I guess you found <laughs> out. And, you know, it's interesting because um, when my wife and I are out and we see people with cute little babies or whatever, she's always looking at them. And I honestly don't even notice them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just not in my focus. Maybe my eyesight is going as I'm getting older or I, I just don't really, I'm not drawn to that. So I, I can relate to the feeling, but you certainly changed and, and rather successfully. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, I did change. I stepped up uh, and I, it, it's funny because having kids um, really can unlock a lot within you if you're open to it and you allow it to, you know, we become, we go from selfish to unselfish, you know, we care more about the world, everything takes on a different meaning. And that is pretty much, you know, what happened to me. And I, and I became a lot more in tune with myself and in touch with my gifts and my ability to uh, use, you know, psychology and read, read people and, and hone their individual personalities and um, just create that independence and that autonomy that turned out to be a skill set that made me a better parent, as opposed to the one who was so entrenched in being a mom and wanting, you know, what do they think of me and how, uh, you know, if I say no, will they be mad? Like I, it, I think my attitude prior to having kids set me up for being a better parent in terms of just kind of not being controlling and not being having the need to be involved in so much. It was better for them and better for now, me. <laughs> now, parenting is a full-time job, being a mom in, in a lot of instances, but you have a lot more than that. So people need to know more about you. You have Ask Mom Parenting. You're a mom of four, as we've said, wife of a career military officer, which means he was gone a lot because he yes. had to serve the country founder of three businesses and award-winning author. What do you, what do you do in your spare time? I mean, that's, that's a I lot. Work. I'm a typical entrepreneur and I work and I'm, my mind is always going, I'm creative. I've got ideas. I'm already thinking about my second book. Uh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, my mind is just always going. That's all I can say. Really. Uh, I don't, I, in my spare time, I just have downtime with my husband. I like to read, you know, we, we enjoy our, our downtime, but I am, I work from home, which makes it a little bit easier and I guess trickier to walk away, but I love what I do. So it's okay. Now we were talking a little bit before we, we, we started rolling for the podcast. I told you, I've, I actually read the book Yeah. Um, and the name of the book is secrets to parenting without giving, and I was, should I say the name or not? I'm going to say it without giving a fuck. That's the name of the book. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have five kids, so I was fascinated by it. And um, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, already having read your book, it's already changed my parenting style really? because it's made me a lot more conscious of how I'm talking to my children and how they're perceiving that interaction. Because there was a part where you talk about you don't you probably treat strangers better than you, you treat your kids in a way. Don't we, though? Don't we? Yeah. We do. Yeah. And that really yeah. hit home with me. I was like, wow, I'm not even, no wonder I'm not getting the response I want because I'm talking down to them. 
You know, that's awesome. Good for you for, you know, putting that mirror on yourself, which is what it takes to be, uh, you know, uh, to show up differently for your kids. You know, I always say that when you're a parent who's dealing with, with challenging behavior, you have to ask yourself what you can do differently because the kid's not reacting to us. You know, we're not reacting to your child. The child's reacting to you. So if you change, they change. It's kind of counterintuitive thought process than what we're taught. We're taught change the behavior, change the child. And that's really kind of coming from a disrespectful point of view that, you know, your child is reacting to you. Uh, so um, I, you know, I appreciate that feedback that, that you, you may be taking a little bit extra time to think, how am I showing up for my child? What am, how am I, how are my words being perceived and heard? And sometimes it just takes that awareness of a tiny tweak, just one little redirect and, you know, the kid responds. Mm -hmm. If I'm leading an organization and have people working under me I, I, and, and everything is going wrong, I can't just blame them. I mean, sure, you can hire some bad people, but if, if it's not going well, you have to look at maybe how you're presenting your message and how it's getting through. And if they're not hearing it, then you're not doing your job. Right. So you want to you want to go back and, and sort of just regroup and ask yourself, you know, what what you can do differently. And kind of that's where that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book and why I mentor, because at least in my case and in the book, um, I share my journey from, you know, not wanting kids to my my growth process. My my learning curve was like a vertical line because I went from, you know, one to four kids didn't really want any. Now, oh, my God, I got four kids. Uh, I really had to learn quickly on my feet and you know, yelling and you're doing all these things that we do, we, you know, we punish and timeouts. And that's really where it, the, it crystallizes in people's brains. It's like, oh shit, I've done everything. And I don't know what more to do. We think we're doing the right thing, but the behavior never changes. So now we have to say, all right, what more can I do? And we just, we fall flat. We don't know what else there is to do. And that's why I felt compelled to write the book and share these methods so that other parents can learn, you know, my kids are grown now and in college. And I, I have the benefit of knowing that these methods work. Now it's important for me with, with this podcast, one of the ideas behind it was to find out what people are actually doing to move the world. I mean, I think a lot of it with you is obvious because I, th I think parenting is a huge problem in this country. You've written a book to address it, but when you think of yourself and put yourself in that situation of defining that, how would you tell people you're moving the world? Well, I like to say that I am mending the dynamic um, with how children are being raised between the parent and the child. So there's a dynamic there that the parent feels that they need to be authoritarian or they need to be controlling or they need to clamp down and they don't understand that restriction creates rebellion. They don't know some of these counterintuitive methods that are really rooted in respect. So what I'm really trying to do is reach out to as many parents as I can to teach these methods, to teach this, I really call it the mindset for parenting on purpose. It's a very deliberate, very intuitive, very, you know, intentional, uh, but it's on purpose. And there is a purpose with what we say and do and why we say and do it. So that is really how I feel like I'm changing the world and I can't change it fast enough or far enough. I, oh, whoever I can get in front of, or whoever I can talk to, whoever I can help, I'm so motivated by that. Um, you know, yes, I have a couple other businesses, but this is my my soul's purpose. This is really something I feel strongly about and that I truly believe in. Yeah, one of the things that came up in the, the film we made, Licensed to Parent, was you're not just a parent from birth to 17 or 18 years old when they go off to college. That's a lifelong job you're, you're taking on. How you define that role changes over the years. You can go from having to be the leader of the organization to having more of an of not a friends, but you can be friends with your kids when they're older because you communicate differently, but certainly not when they're growing up. There has to be a hierarchy. I have a word for that. And I've, very, I've thought very long and hard about the word because this is something a lot of parents uh, really are sort of divided on. And you've got half the parents that go, well, I don't care what you say. They're my friend. I want to be their friend. And at any age, so they're very, very you know, in fact about that. And then there's the parents that are like, screw that. I'm not your friend. I'm your parent. Ah, la, la, la. Very divided. Okay. And I have a word that bridges the gap and that word is partnership. So I teach partnership parenting methods and being a partner is just a very respectful way of, of handling, you know, situations with your children and, and, and dealing with them because it's very respectful and it's, it's, you know, if you read the book, you know, uh, whether our children are adults in training, 
And if they're adults in training, I know I'm growing my best friend. They're not there yet. They're not my best friend at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, even as teenagers, because they need my leadership. I'm huge about leadership. That's probably going to be my second book. Uh, leadership is, you know, as parents, we're leaders, we're role models. And I really liken that to even just being an entrepreneur. And, you know, my husband is a, a general in the Air Force, and he says he's learned more about leadership through just watching me and how I interact with the kids in, in my business is leadership across the board and leadership is lacking across, the, I mean, everywhere you look, it's lacking. So we need more leaders. And so the parents, you know, really want to step into that leadership role. And it's like I said, it's, uh, you know, they're our friend, they're our little buddy, but we're partners. And that's kind of like, I walk with you. I'm not ahead of you telling you what to do. I'm not pushing you from behind. I'm not, I don't have an agenda. I'm side by side and I'm there for you, but I'm a facilitator. So that's important designation for me. Sure. I mean, the parents I know that say that they're friends, quote, friends with their children tend to be the ones that, um, are very defensive about their children because if you say something about their child, you're saying something about their friend. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I have a problem with that uh, only because I, I, it's hard to punish your friends. It's hard to, 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 to do discipline and lay down rules for your friends. So I think those are totally different dynamics. That's a great uh, perspective. I, I like that. I like what you're saying there. Um, but if you're parenting with the, in the back of your mind of thinking that eventually this will be your friend because as an adult, you know, we really kind of, now you've got kids that are a little older. So, you know, if you're in your, if you've got your first child and he's, and you're, you're cutting your teeth on your first one and you can't really see the future. Now I, I've got the perspective of this being in my rear view mirror and I'm like, okay, yeah, eight, nine, 10. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be your friend. I can see that future for you now, but when you're in that moment, um, you know, they're not, they're not your friend. They really need that leadership. They really need you to role model your, your, um, your goals and your, you know, your, whatever your rules are, whatever your morals are, this is what they need from you most. Now you had a teacher that, um, asked you what you said was a brilliant three word question that you said sliced through your ignorance and your ego. They said, is it working? Yeah. Oh yeah. I would, I went to my very first parenting class because at that time my oldest was four and the triplets were one and a half. And my husband was a, in combat at the time. Um, and I was, you know, we had no friends and family where, where, I, where I was living. I was running my business. I was sleeping at red lights, just exhausted. And my, ch- my older one was acting out and I just was talking to the, the, the preschool teacher and she said, Oh, we offer a parenting class. And I am, okay, I'll take it. Well, you know, I, I guess I could stop yelling, but you know, I felt very uh, justified in the fact that I was screaming at my kids to the point where my throat hurt. I felt very justified. Well, you know, four kids under four, I'm a victim. I got these three kids at once, right? And my husband's at war, he's getting shot at. I, I, I'm i running a business. I mean, come on, of course I'm yelling. I'm doing a pretty, I thought she was going to say, you know, get some cough drops, you're doing a great job. Mm. Uh, so my, my whiff of arrogance in that moment was really just cut through with this. Okay, great. Is it working? And who splash of cold water on the face? Like, shit, I guess it's not really working. So, okay. I straightened up and fly right now. Like <laughs> I, I've got a lot to learn. And that was kind of, um, a crystallizing moment for me that, oh shit, I guess I need to learn some new tricks. And that was the beginning of me just, I wasn't ready to learn anything or wouldn't have learned anything if I weren't ready to check my ego at the door. And that's why I start with um, ego in my book, because yeah. that's the most important thing for parents is to realize that we don't have all the answers. And if we think we do, then we're not open to learning and our children teach us if we're open to it. Um, so, you know, when my son's eyes glazed over at me, when I was screaming up in his face, like, you know, do it because I said and like it. My older kid was just looking at me with these eyes, like, screw you, you know, like if he could talk, he was just looking at me. And I had to say, I got to do better. It's not working. So yeah. yeah. If I, just... I I've... go ahead. Oh, I'm go, ahead. Go, ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I, cause <laughs> I, I've modified that to the point where I I've always said, how's that working for you? And Uh it's kind of the same thing. It was a realization for you that it's not, it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you don't meet with 
um, a person who is open to that possibility that, okay, I guess, you know, that's the, what do they say? That's the definition of insanity, continuing to do the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and we all get to our stage of readiness at different times. We all have our own journey. We're all going along and our, on our a splash of cold water comes at various times, different, different moments crystallize in our brain that, okay, I guess I need to learn some new things. We all start out doing what we think is right. Um, but in my case, I was just really, really overwhelmed and super tired. And I just needed him to do what I said when I said it and be happy that I asked. <laughs> so um, I didn't realize, and I don't think, and this is, gets back to your documentary, you know, licensed to parent. Um, parents, we, no matter how much we try, we don't have any um, awareness of what it's going to take. I had no idea how layered and nuanced parenting really is. It's, it's just my gosh, there's so many layers and, Mm -hmm. um, you can't just speak to a child. Like you speak to a friend, they don't understand. Right. And I I think people have no idea what they're getting into. And, and the reality is the only vetting you really go through is when they make sure the car seat is fastened in as you're leaving the hospital. That's so beyond that it's here. Have a nice life. Isn't it? It's a real, a real awakening, isn't it? Yeah. I, I remember being, whoa, they're just handing me this child. And, you know, and for some of these people who don't have help, like my mom came to town and my husband was there and helpful and uh, just surrounded by support. Um, I don't know how these people do it. And it's, it's truly heartbreaking. And I, my heart goes out to anyone who doesn't have that support. Um, it's just, it's, it's just backbreaking. I mean, it really is. It's, it's difficult. And that's really the biggest thing that was behind the film is we don't support parents enough. You know, we'll, we'll give the dirty, the dirty eyes to the woman whose child is screaming in the supermarket or running around the restaurant when you were tripping children in, in your book. But, um, but the reality is that's not what they need at the time. Sure. Some parents deserve that because they're doing nothing to stop their child. And they might think, oh, Timmy can do whatever he wants. Let him go. But there's a lot of parents that are doing their best, but nobody's helping them. Exactly. And I, and I got a taste of it when my husband was gone and I was living in a small Southern town and my parents were in New York city and I was by myself and my oldest was colic. And I mean, you know, I, I got a taste of it, but my mom was always a call away to where I could say, can you schedule some time in a couple of weeks to come down and help me out? Um, so in those little in between moments where my husband was gone, I knew, you know, the cavalry was coming and I could just get through it. Um, you know, it's, but I've, but I've had those moments where I know, my gosh, what would I do if, if I didn't have help? And I, when I was pregnant with the triplets, we lived in Tucson and there was another, I was a high risk pregnancy and there was another triplet pregnancy. And this was a girl who had had sex for the first time with her boyfriend, got pregnant with triplets and had, and her family kicked her out. I, I, that was talk about dichotomy there. What, what is that poor girl doing? What, what happened there? You know? Um, so it's sad. It's really sad. You're right. There's so much more we could be doing to support parents. Yeah. Now when people come to you, um, it involves, I think we touched on this briefly. Parents have to be willing to change because you say change yourself and your child changes when you change kids respond. So it's not just trying out new stuff on them. You actually have to start living it yourself. Don't you? Oh, sure. You, you have to uh, really sort of deep dive yourself and ask yourself, what am I saying? What response am I getting? And then what can I do different to get a different result? And uh, like we were saying, you know, we are taught generation after generation that we need to change the child to get the behavior to change. And that's not the case at all the child is responding to us. And so when we tweak our actions, our child responds. And that is just a counterintuitive thought that is when I work with parents, you know, that seems illogical to them because without further insight, they jump to the conclusion that it's permissive parenting or that it's why should I change my child? This is authoritarian mentality that their child has to fall in line and they're just going to keep trying to take that square peg and put it in that round hole and they're not accepting that that it's not working so when we soften that defensiveness just a bit and get through to the parent that they hold all the you know i don't like the word power but they do hold the power to change 
And that when they tweak their actions, it's sometimes such a small little change and the kids just, you know, respond immediately. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I'll tell everybody right off the bat. I've, I've already tried a few of those things. They do work. There, there's a huge oh, difference. Oh, would you try? So, oh, I'd you love know, to know. Yeah. I would just, uh, as I said to you earlier, most of it is just in the tone of the way mm-hmm. when I'm trying to get them to do something and how I'm speaking to them, how I'm, what my expectations are, you know, not making them feel bad about themselves because they, they did something that you know they shouldn't have done. It's just yeah. putting a whole different spin on it. And I, I, I think it makes a huge difference. Well, I'm so glad. Thank you for that feedback, Um, especially for teenagers. uh, It's so important to really pick and choose. And I truly loved the teenage years. If I could, and maybe I should just focus with so many parents that between three and five really get a lot of value from what I teach. But I love the teenage years because they're, they just need a little respect. And if you give them that trust, and it's just so validating for them and just using certain words uh, I have a whole script that I write out, you know, that we, that we work with, with the parents. I mean, key words like we and agreed and certain things just get that buy-in and subconsciously, you know, I have a chapter in there about programming and it's powerful stuff that teenagers really respond to. And um, I just, it's, I find it fun and it's so rewarding because especially with teenagers, parents see quicker results with my methods uh, than they do when they're younger, because the little kids need a little bit more repetition to take on some of these techniques. But yeah, I'm glad that you found some benefit there. Thanks. Well, teenagers don't, you know, they get to that age, they don't want anything to do with you. They don't, yeah. they don't respect what you're saying. And a lot of times, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a battle every day. One of the most important things I thought you mentioned, though, is your kids have to know that you're not for sale. Yeah. And yeah. So it really has to be both parents. If it's a two parent home, you both have to be on the same page because if dad's not for sale, but mom is, it's not going to fix anything, is it? Yeah. Well, whoever's with the child, you know, most is and whoever's really home setting the rules. And so like, I was never that mom. I couldn't be that mom that said, wait till your dad gets home. And I don't really think we have that many parents like that anymore. I think moms and dads have equal you know, say in two parent homes, or even if they're in their single parents going from mom and dad's house, I think that I don't really run into a whole lot of moms or dads giving up the power to the other, like, wait till your mom gets home. Um, but yes, it's, um, it's so imperative that parents have a mindset and I teach mindset. I'm very big about that. It's just empowering the parent to understand the consistency that they need and the role modeling they need to do. And just that, that, you know, having very few rules and having the, that boundary and then giving kids that freedom in between those strict boundaries to make decisions and to be able to make mistakes and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, it's, it's a, it's a tricky dynamic, <laughs> but once you're made aware of it and you see how it works, it's, it's great stuff. Now you talk about the magic mantra, I'm only in charge of me, I'm not in charge of you. And I've heard that in other terms where, you know, don't get ag- don't agonize over, over things you can't control. And that's really one of the things that, that struck me the most is I was trying to be responsible for everything that they did and taking it personal, as opposed to just you tell them what you want them to do. You, you, but you, it's not your problem if they are not doing well in school. Eventually it becomes their problem. <sighs> I'm so glad that resonated. You know, when you, when you do things sort of innately and then you try to write it in a book and you try to explain it, you don't know, but I do get a lot of feedback on that. The magic mantra and you, you know, as you read in the book, it just was, but those thankless teenage years, you know, when I was, and then times four, you know, all in a concentrated amount of time. It's so thankless, isn't it? Just, they just, like you said, they don't respect what you have to say. I had to speak in bullet points you know, hierarchy type, you know, yeah, I get, I get 30 seconds. What do I want to say? Um, and that's why I, one of my favorite chapters is how to get your kids to tell you everything. You know, that's a whole new other concept, but in the magic mantra, I just really, that took letting go of control to a whole new level for me. And I needed a mantra daily in the teenage years to go, well, oh, not involved. I'm not needed. They need to solve it. I had to really come up with some sound bite that was going to help me remember that every day. Uh, because, you know, with, t- with four and, you know, with five, you're kind of like, 
if you don't have confidence like in yourself, you're going to shrivel and shrink under the, the pressure of these teens. Like it's a lot. Uh, but yeah, the magic mantra is super powerful. And I taught it to the kids. And I'm telling you, one of my four constantly tells me how he uses it in school and how he uses it with friends and in his social dynamics. So it's not just for parents. I teach that first half of the book is for you and your relationship with yourself. But a lot of those same things intertwine into the second half of the book with your relationship with your kids. And the magic mantra applies to you. And then we teach it to the kids. And it's powerful for them too. Yeah, I think that's important. There used to be a show on years ago. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's, it's not about parenting. It was called Hill Street Blues. I've and heard it of was it. Just, I never it's saw just, it. It's just the way they shot it. But it was a police precinct where the, the head guy of the precinct, that was a captain or whatever, everything went through him. Everybody's throwing stuff at him all the time. So he's dealing with everybody's problem. And that's really what parenting is like. If you have more yes. than one child, you're catching it from all sides. You got to be on your game. I felt like those air traffic, you know, those guys on the airline, you know, that are like, you know, this and, you know, go uh -huh. this way. I, I, I would literally come out of my office where I was making decisions, immersed in my job, get up, go into the kitchen. The kids would come, what we hear. Yeah. Be home at seven, blah, blah, blah. you know, all, and you're making decisions on the fly many times with things that you have never seen before or had to deal with before with kids. It's every, it's something different every day, which is why when I wrote this book, it was very important to me to to talk mindset and foundational methods, because I don't think it's helpful to anybody to just talk about, Oh, if you're having a tantrum, do this. If you're having, it's so much parenting is so much more than just a, a, a moment's behavior. It's, it's, it's helping the parent come up with these foundational techniques and mindset that they can apply to every situation, because I can't possibly predict every situation, um, but having been through it, like I said, through, you know, teens in every phase, I wrote this book with that in mind that if I can arm you with those thoughts and that philosophy and empower you with that confidence and that role modeling, then you'll be able to be equipped for anything that, that comes your way. Yeah. Some of the, one of the toughest things is actually getting them to put their device down and look at you. I've, I say, if I had to uh, describe my kid to a sketch artist, I would be drawing the top of his head. <laughs> Because always looking yeah. down on a on a phone, and, and you got to get them to focus. But, but they you hear you. They yeah. hear you. They. I, I'm telling you, how old is your oldest? Um, well, I have older children too. I have three oh, older ones. So you've ones. been through. Okay, so yeah, you know, they, it, it all comes around. Yeah, it all comes around. You have that benefit of knowing that now, so you know that you know all the things that you say, it goes in. But it takes a long time for it to come back around. I mean, it really does. You know, it, 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 when they're teenagers, I remember those years with my, my three older ones. Now they're very rewarding relationships. So mm -hmm. yeah, you really do have to just hang in there. Now, one thing you said that's interesting, know when you're winning and say nothing. It's kind of like with sales. Once, they, once you throw the number out, shut your mouth. Yeah. But parents yeah. always want to dig in another lesson or a point. Don't and you're we... saying, don't do that. No, yeah. Oh gosh. If you, if, yeah, in the back of your mind, if you're thinking, I'm winning, you know, just like I said, if there's some of these little, little hacks to kind of cut through that moment to get you to stop talking. Um, yes. Know when you're winning Help me in so many ways. And for example, my daughter, you know, great kid, but her room was a pigsty. Nothing I was going to do was going to change that. I mean, it was atrocious and uh, nothing. My boys spotless and organized. And yeah, I had my moments where I tried to tell her, go clean. You can't do this until you clean. I tried everything, but you know what? It just wasn't going to stick. So what I have to do is I have to stop and ask myself, does she have a good set of friends? Is she doing a sport? Is, does she have a job? Does she have good grades? Is she, where, she was firing on every cylinder, but the one with her room, right? Why? I'm winning. I am winning. I have a teenage daughter who wants to go to, on dates with me every week, you know, to the movies. And she tells me everything and we have a great relationship and let it go. I'm winning. So just stop and take stock of the moment and of what you're looking to, to do. Like, and in the book, I have that example. You ask your son to go empty the dishwasher and he's grumbling under his breath. Your instinct is to go, Hey, whoa, what did you say? What did you know? but he's on his way to empty the dish. He's doing what you asked. You're winning. No, when you're winning, let that mumbling under his breath go because it doesn't mean anything. That really struck with me too. I mean, I, I, I pointed out instances where I maybe was getting him to do what I want, but you're trying to throw that lesson in there along the yeah. way. 
Yeah, and we you do don't that. have to do that. Yeah, we we all are guilty of that. And, and another thing that um, I thought was interesting: if your kids are talking to you, you're fortunate. You had your daughter was telling you a lot of stuff. You can't react to it, right? You can't judge. You can't oh. make them pay for that honesty that they're sharing oh, with you. Huge, huge. You you cannot make them pay for the honesty, and we do it. We all do it. But if we, one of the biggest things that I really teach parents is you know looking for patterns and parenting in advance. And if you're parenting in advance, it means you're prepared. So we're prepared for big picture stuff as much as we can be so that when these little moments come up, we have our, our mindset ready and we're, we're already pre-thinking about how we're going to respond or what we're going to say. Um, and so then you're prepared for that moment, right? So yeah, it's, it's definitely a way of just thinking ahead and knowing how we're going to get that child to uh, respond or to get us to talk. We cannot, we have to brand ourselves as unshockable. And no matter what I'm in my mind going, holy, whoa, you know, I, it, and, and the, the teen years are really about filing everything away. It's, it's like the puppet strings in the back. We are like literally behind the curtain with the puppet strings and then we, you know, we have to shape it and we have to reattack. And it's very, you know, layered and multidimensional when they get to the teen years. But literally, you're unshockable, you know. And uh, part of the stress for my husband and I was just that, you know, we always had ears listening. So I couldn't really go. I couldn't be like, when he got home from work, you're not going to believe this. You know, we had to go out to dinner. So we had freedom to talk because you just every day is some new revelation of things that you're learning. It's just funny. Well, I think one of the challenges with with parents, and I know your husband being in the military, probably super organized, you had a million things going on, that when kids come to you with stuff and their problems you can easily solve, you can't just fix everything for them and make it easy for them. You have to find a way to let them figure it out. But, but a lot of times it's easier for us to solve the problem and fix it than it is to go through that process. So true, especially as an entrepreneur and I don't have any employees, so I just do everything myself. And I did have to overcome that, which is why, you know, I talk about ego, letting go of control, not doing guilt, all of these certain, all of these traits and personality traits and characteristics that I talk about are things that I had to learn were detrimental when they became to my, when they came to my parenting. Um, yeah, we have to know where to let go. We have to know that Again, mindset. My mindset is to grow independent, accountable kids. And I can't do that if I'm solving their problems. And if you can learn how to structure your home as much as possible, like the real world, to where they're having to be accountable for their actions under the safety net of your home, where you aren't solving that, by the time they get 18, they're wise beyond their years. And I saw this work with my own. By the time they got to college and they all went out of, out of state, they're all out of town. Um, just how much more, you know, big picture thinking they are now that they're not, they don't, they don't have to go out and, and be rebellious because it just, you know, they don't have to prove anything to anybody. So it, it really works. Didn't you have them making their lunches at four years old? Yeah. Oh yes. Yes. <laughs> I did. I, I did. I did. Yeah, oh, and you can't believe how capable they really are capable of doing it. If you set your home with all the, you know, the, the bread and they can choose the kind of bread they want, you know, here's what I expect. I put the account, you know, here's my, uh, my rules. Um, you need to have a sandwich you need to have a fruit. You need to have, you know, a juice. Here's what you need to do. I'm the leader. I'm setting the tone. Here's the boundaries and your freedom within the boundaries. Choose your bread. You know, they get to choose. They told me through all the years, mom, you can't believe so-and-so throws all her, you know, her mom makes her lunch and she puts leftovers and she does all this. She never eats it. She gives away all of her lunch. My kids ate their lunch because they made it mm -hmm. and they would be responsible for, you know, Hey, so-and-so brought a, uh, you know, some type of flavored something to school. Can you buy this? Yeah. Put it on the list. Yep. Sure. They're in charge of, you know, helping me build the list. I'll go buy it. It's on their level. And I mean, I, times four kids. Yeah. I'll clean out your lunchbox, but you're making your lunch and it worked. And they did their own laundry too at like five and six. Wow. Send them over here. That, that, I think yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> well, you know, it's just set it up and train them and they do it the younger, the better. <laughs> I believe that now wisdom and common sense are teachable, trainable. And what's more, it's our responsibility as parents to do just that. Talk about that. Well, like I was just saying, uh, certain tactics that I use to try to get my kids to become wise beyond their years. It was very deliberate on my part. 
Um, I'm a very big picture person. So I would always try to get the kids to be um, making decisions as much as possible and then teaching them the ways to make those decisions and looking at, you know, awareness and looking around you and using free information to come in and inform the big picture. So this is what I do in my business. This is how I run my household. It's just that I have an ex- it's this dynamic decision process where if I'm in the moment um, and I'm in the weeds, I always rise up to the big picture, put it through the filter of where am I going? What does, do I really even care about this? You know, run it through this filter and then make my decision, which is more informed. And so this is, these are some of the things that I taught the kids to do to make decisions, which gave them wisdom. And um, I'm just big about wisdom and connecting to your gut and, you know, looking at stepping back and looking at trends, looking at patterns, making decisions on that. How does that fit into what you think? Um, you know, should you change your mind about that? How do you think that's going to affect you down the line? Always thinking toward the future, never in the fishbowl of the moment. We all tend to be in those weeds and um, it doesn't really do you any good. If you can teach a child to go, if then, if this, then that, then you're, you know, you're getting them to think with wisdom. Yeah. Now you said be aware of your own personal tripwires and how they affect your position on punishment. So there's some things that might trigger me that maybe it's not worth punishing them for, but it's because it's just something that matters to me. Sure. Yeah. If you're really fastidious and you need your house really, really neat and you can't, if there's socks on the floor and that really, really is your thing and that bothers you, uh, then you might tend to be apt to punish your child for that. Whereas that's, that's yours. You own that. That's you. You have that idiosyncrasy, know that, admit that about yourself and just let it go. You're only in charge of you. You know, there is a fine line between parenting and not letting them be a pig. Like if you've got certain things that really bother you and we all have those things, uh, know that about yourself and don't apply that to everyone else in the home. And this makes you a better partner too, better leader, better boss. These awarenesses trickle into all the other aspects of your life. Yeah, that, that to me, what I thought was, was the most interesting thing about the book. I mean, everybody oh, can really? criticize. Well, yeah, well, it, it's that how they apply to other things, how things you do and the impact that, that it has. I mean, I pulled a lot of other stuff out there that made me think of the consequences of things that I was doing as a parent and, and what you should let go of and what you should not let go of. And, you know, I don't know if those maybe they weren't the intended messages, but you oh, yeah. know, I was sitting there applying them. No, I love it. I I think that's great. I think as long as you're willing to ask yourself, there are no right or wrong answers. All it is, is just creating a mechanism to get you to, to to get in touch with yourself and ask yourself how you're showing up for your child as a parent. So just asking yourself the question and giving yourself an honest answer. That's like, yeah, I am really, really, it really makes me angry to see dishes in the sink, whatever it is. Um, You know, so I, and maybe that's a bad example because that's a household thing where, you know, but like if it's a real just personal thing that really bothers you, are you punishing your child for something that you know is your own issue? And we can't, we just, it's just, again, that self-awareness and, and knowing um, where you need to lead and, and where, where it bleeds together, you know, you're only in charge of you and is my, Um, idiosyncrasy bleeding into what everyone else is doing and how I'm parenting them and am I punishing them for it? Like, it's just silly. So if you had to give one piece of advice to somebody who's thinking about having children or maybe somebody who's mired in a bunch of children, (laughs) something that that could really just maybe spark them and go and turn it around for them, what would you tell them? So much. I think the overriding thing is, is learning to trust yourself. I mean, it really comes to, it's a relationship with yourself first. Parenting is, starts with your relationship with yourself and trust is super important. Trusting your gut, trusting that, you know, what's best for your family, trusting that you can build and and hone that relationship with your kids. It really, I do a lot of reinforcing that confidence and that empowerment with the parent. And when the parent is right with that, everything else follows. Um, I know that doesn't help their moment right now. You know, people want some magical, like how to handle a behavior or something, but it's just always keep the big picture. It's a mindset and trust yourself because I find that 
If you're controlling, you don't trust, you have fear. If you've got guilt, you don't trust, you have fear. Um, if your ego is involved, that's a defense mechanism. You don't trust, you have fear. It's all stemming from not trusting yourself and maybe looking out, outside and going, what are they doing? And how is that working for them? Who cares? You know, shore yourself up. All right. So how do people get your book? Where do they, where's the best place for them to find it? Um, Amazon. I'm on iTunes, Barnes and Noble. Uh, so yeah, any of those places. And just so we can say the name of the book again. <laughs> secrets, to par- secrets to parenting without giving a fuck. Absolutely. And, and I would tell people it's highly worth reading. It's not, it's not one of those books that's going to take you two months to read because it's 5,000 pages of scientific mumbo jumbo. It's down in the trenches stuff that can really help people. And I, and I thought it was fantastic. So uh, Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I really enjoyed it. And then you have a website. How can people reach out to you there? Yeah. Askmomparenting.com. And on Instagram and Facebook, follow me on either uh, platform, Ask Mom Parenting. And when's the next book coming out? What's, what's it going to be? Oh boy. I, oh, I don't know. I'm right now I'm trying to work on a yelling course that people can download. I've got, I've got a lot of stuff going on, but I, I just came up with a title um, for my next book. I, I think it's going to be on leadership. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Awesome. I will look forward to it because I'm, I'm sure I'll you. give it a read. Sue, thank you so thank much for coming on today. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this week's Move the World podcast. There are a ton of books that are out there on parenting. And as a parent, having read Sue's book, I'm seeing how the things that she talked about in the book have already made a difference for me. So if you're a parent who's feeling overwhelmed by all the things that are coming at you, try doing something about it. The theme for my films and podcasts is don't just continue as you are and do nothing. Do something. We'll see you next time.